Welcome to Are We There Yet? The podcast looking at the innovations emerging from the workshops, labs and secret test tracks of Hyundai. Across this series, we've heard about amazing technology and in this edition, we're right at the cutting edge. We're going to be hearing about projects which are utilising artificial intelligence, robotics, autonomous driving, a new world of mobility. Whether it's to deliver a pizza or maybe in the future to carry heavy loads, from their car to the house or even up the stairs. I think we don't even know yet how much we will use robotics in the future. What Hyundai is doing right now is to aggressively enter this space. I'm Susie Perry and this podcast comes to you from Hyundai Motor. Now, I've always been amazed at how far technology has come. And I mean this from our point of view, the consumer. We're kings now, aren't we? When I look back at the pre-digital age, the 70s and 80s, our home tech, for example, it seems so basic. Although I have to say the humble radio never ceases to blow my mind. But instead of having to have or use or carry around diaries, notebooks, maps, encyclopedia, secretaries, accountants, walkmans, cameras, televisions, tape measures, roller decks, shops, calculators, edit suites, alarm clocks, translators, newspapers, magazines, gyms, record players, I could go on, but you get the gist. We now have all of these in a tiny little box in our pocket called our phone. Now, don't get me wrong, you can't beat a drink with your mate down the pub. But recently, consumer digital platforms even had that covered. And now, through this podcast, you're hearing me via my phone and a natty little mic that I bought on my phone. So today, we're going to learn more about innovation and where these ideas are born and how they get to us. We're with someone who's leading the way in innovation at Hyundai, Edwin Eriksson, Head of Office at Cradle Berlin. Cradle being the Centre for Robotic Augmented Design in Living Experiences. Edwin, good to have you on the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Susie. Very pleased to be here. I've just been talking about how much consumer technology has changed over the last few decades and the fact that as consumers now, we are the kings. We have so much to play with. Do you feel like that? Well, yeah, it's amazing to see, as you say, how this has changed very recently with the most consumer or customer-centric approach when technologies are being developed, obviously in the mobile phones, but also And that's where we are contributing uh, when it comes to cars and and handling the cars, um, finding ways how to be able to interact closer with with the the passengers, with the customers, um, offering quite unique um, services, make them feel more convenient uh, and happy. I'm excited to learn all about that side of car technology. And in terms of, of driving cars, for you, has the love been about the cars or has it always been the technology side? I'm definitely not a, a petrol head in that sense. Of course, I, I'm fascinated about cars and vehicles, but it's beyond the car itself. It's really the technology. Of course, the engine is still... Uh, well, I shouldn't say a mystery, but uh, something, uh, an amazing device, an amazing machine is quite amazing for me. But now now when we are moving to seeing basically smartphones with reels on the street with all the new technologies, the connectivity, the services, um, yeah, even customized solutions for passengers, that is the area where, where I'm happy to be part of and, and contribute with. That's incredible that you've just said that. Excited to find out about all of your ideas. Uh, Where did your love of technology begin? How how did you first know that you were a little bit geeky? I would actually say that my passion for for new technologies, being an engineer, it has always been like that. But uh, specifically, just started towards the end of my studies. And now I'm probably disclosing my age (laughs) is where the internet started. Yeah, internet, I would say, has been a key factor on raising my my interest uh, for new technologies and maybe also deciding that that is probably the way I want to go. It's opened the world so much in so many different ways, isn't it? And now here you are heading up Cradle, which is a a great title for a place which is giving birth to some amazing ideas. Can you give me an idea of what your mission is at Cradle? Uh, Yeah, sure. So a couple of years back, the company Hyundai realized that, um, hey, we are great at building cars uh, in manufacturing and, and getting great in design. But we should think about what's what's beyond that. Do we still want to be a car maker in five and ten years? Is that going to keep us uh, alive, 
or do we need to find new areas where we would like to focus on? As a result, uh, the company um, identified five strategic future growth areas where the company would like to be present in and explore further, but also have the plan to open up, uh, find partnerships to lay the paths together towards those. So the five areas are smart mobility, smart city, robotics, energy, and artificial intelligence. Clearly, it shows a direction away from just building cars, maybe more uh, focusing on sustainable, getting closer to customers, but also with a clear mission to become even more innovative. And ultimately, this, I suppose, leads to a better quality of life for the buyer. Is that the idea? Exactly. And that brings us back a little bit to the mission uh, of, of, of Cradle it is really... Um, hey, we, we are going in those directions. We know what we can in-house, but we also know what we, what we are not able to do. So our role is really to find the right partners who can help us to go in, in those five areas. And the way we as Cradle do that is to really search for innovative technologies, um, innovative partners who uh, the way we work is, does the technology that we are looking into, does it contribute to improving the quality of life in terms of sustainability, um, safety, convenience, and, and also satisfaction. And how difficult is it to find these pioneers of, of technology in robotics or AI or wherever you're looking? Because I imagine that sometimes they are can be kids coming out of school, going through university. Yeah. So my, my job consists, of course, to, to build up a team and, and find the right people, um, definitely the first thing is you have to have the passion for technology. You have to be able to think forward and maybe to look at maybe some crazy ideas, crazy technologies out there, which on the first sight might be totally unrealistic to, to handle, but have the vision on can we take this, maybe modify it a little bit and then bring it to something meaningful. Um, but once we find the technology, it has to fit the strategy. There should be a business behind that, a market behind that. And, but I have to admit at that time that the term what we are using, open innovation, it was rather new and not many companies were, were doing this kind of activity, meaning to go outside and source technologies uh, instead of developing it by themselves. So would you say at Cradle that you're working with quite a lot of disruptors? People who shake things up, think differently. Well, yes, disruptive people. Um, but the partners we work with, typically startups, but we also do a lot on the academic side and even with established companies, uh, are of course, very passionate entrepreneurs who really love what they do, but they also need to have the the interest and the vision to to work together with a with a with a larger partner. Mm. I suppose it must be quite a complicated process when you've got these incredible ideas and people that you're working with and talking to to get them um, to work together because it's always a balance and a trade off. I suppose against investment and money as well. Um, is it ever frustrating for you when you can see something that you think could be incredible but you just know that you know maybe it's going to cost too much money at this time? So I had many cases where I was so yeah impressed about the technology excited about it and I thought oh this this can this can be a killer application but later realized that it was just too early the market was not ready the company was not ready to handle that and that of course can be frustrating if you then see like two la two years later the same technology being deployed by by another company so learning when is the time right is, is of course, uh, very important Yeah, to, to be successful at the end. The process itself, I don't see a big challenge to convince like startups to, to work with us because obviously they see the benefit of working with a large corporate yeah, to bring their technology into a product, uh, but also help them to, to, to open up a market and, 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 and sell products using that technology. So many startups are actually waiting for these opportunities. Especially here in Europe, you can also see startups, yeah, very proud entrepreneurs who really have the goal that they want to do it by themselves. I mean, it's like their baby in that sense. And, and, and that's something I also respect. I think our role there is, is to figure out other ways how we can work with them 
while still keeping them happy in, in a sense that they can fulfill their dreams, but also from our side that we somehow find uh, a good opportunity there as well. Can we talk a little bit about some of the projects that you have been involved with? Um, autonomous driving seems to be a very hot topic at the moment. So I joined Hyundai uh, two years ago and, and prior to that, I spent uh, about six years in, in Silicon Valley uh, for, for a different company, but also in the automotive space. And, and part of that, my activity over there uh, was to um, yeah, look into autonomous driving related technology, um, specifically in sensor technologies, which are being used for, for autonomy, be it camera solutions, LiDAR, radar and, and, the, and the fusion around that. From my point of view, um, I, I, I'm a big believer in autonomous driving um, because it's, it's just obvious that uh, we need a way to structure the traffic um, yeah, in a better way, take away uh, or reduce the weaknesses of, of human drivers. I'm not saying every human driver is, 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 is dangerous, but we still see uh, too many deaths per year which are caused by failures by, by human drivers. And and obviously autonomous driving, I mean, I say obviously because I believe it, will help reduce that number. Uh, however, uh, it's we're not there yet. Um, but of course, on the other hand, uh, that that's also the opportunity we have. We are seeing how this is progressing, how technologies are getting better, how infrastructure is getting better, which is necessary for that. Uh, but moreover, maybe the most important thing is how um, people, how customers will um, more and more start accepting that. Uh, because that is, uh, in my viewpoint, still um, yeah, a big challenge. And can I ask you to put some sort of time frame on? <laughs> because to me, it seems, personally, I like driving my car. but it, it So it feels like it's a long way off for me. But I keep on hearing about it and I keep seeing these tests and I keep hearing about all this technology and how incredible it is. And But it is it is changing a, a, a big mindset here, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, talking about a, a, a date or a timeline is, is, of course, difficult. If you asked me three years ago, I would say 2025 was um, probably going to be the time where we will see more and more uh, fully autonomous cars on the streets. That might still happen. Uh, I believe there will be some regions which uh, will be starting earlier and, 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 and yeah, the pioneers in that space, but still under quite yeah, some restrictions. I have to say, in case of Hyundai, we fully um, uh, pursue that uh, as planned, and we've been quite active in, in preparing that by joint venture with Aptiv, which turned to a company called Motional. So, so I feel like on our side, we are doing the right thing uh, to, to make this happen earlier. Uh, but again, if I, if, I, if I look at the general uh, situation right now, specifically also here, the, the European OEMs, I feel like it's sadly slowing down a little bit because of other priorities. But I still uh, have, I, I'm staying optimistic that we will still have something meaningful kicking off within this decade. So full autonomy. And until then, I think we will see different kind of use cases where we are partly using autonomy for certain services, for certain applications, yeah, delivery service, like last mile delivery service using yeah, robotic vehicles driving around. Um, also, of course, in very geofenced areas or be it things like teleoperations. So having, uh, in a way, a driverless car, but it's still being steered um, controlled by by a human driver who just happens not to sit in the car but somewhere somewhere else. That's really fascinating. Um, you mentioned e vehicles there. Uh, we've talked a lot on this podcast uh, in previous episodes about these and also about hydrogen. And um, uh, we know that you, you, uh, Cradle are also partnered up with Hydrogenius. Right. Could you yeah. could you yeah talk, talk to me a little bit about what's happening there? Yeah, sure. At Hyundai, we are extremely um, yeah, convinced that hydrogen is, 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 is going to be uh, one of the future energy sources for, for vehicle. So we have uh, our clear roadmap uh, with existing vehicles uh, on the street. We have uh, our program on, on using it for trucks. 
Um, and we are also quite actively using our fuel cell systems uh, also for totally different applications, uh, whether, whether these are forklifts, whether these are ships, uh, and even in aerospace. So one of the core activities at Cradle, specifically at Cradle Berlin, is to look for innovative partners in the hydrogen or fuel cell space who have technologies which can contribute challenges like, um, of course, costs, um, safety, efficiency, infrastructure, uh, and, and Hydrogenius, uh, which is a German startup. What they have developed, their technology allows to turn hydrogen basically into an oil. And this oil is safe and can also use existing infrastructure for transportation. You turn it into oil, basically you, you use it for the transportation. And then once you arrive on the destination where, where you need your hydrogen, you're basically turning it back to, to hydrogen again. The benefit is that the whole process of the transportation is, is safer uh, and you can reuse the existing infrastructure. So you don't need to create specific equipment, tanks, vehicles to transport the, the hydrogen in a safe manner. Oh, that's, that sounds incredible. I, I wanted to ask you how, how essential it is for Hyundai to have an enterprise like Cradle working with them because it, it seems you know now as though Hyundai have transformed themselves from an auto manufacturer to something completely different. Yeah, absolutely. We have Cradle offices in Berlin to cover the European area. We have one in Tel Aviv for the Israeli startup ecosystem. Of course, in Silicon Valley, uh, in Beijing, uh, and, and of course, uh, in Singapore, uh, which is also very uh, innovative. These locations were, were picked, uh, obviously, because there is a lot of innovation going on there. And, and that uh, also reflects a little bit uh, one of our tasks, is to be, to be present in certain areas where there are a lot of innovations ongoing, to establish these partnerships, but also to understand new trends, in which direction is the industry going, could we try out um, certain regions to test a new technology in a specific market. And, and that's why I also really like working here is I, I feel from the headquarter that our role is extremely important and, and they are, they're giving us also a lot of um, opportunities to, to, to do what we think is, is necessary to be done because we know the area here, uh, we, we, we know the industry here uh, and they are leveraging on that to create these kind of new opportunities uh, which can be done. It seems as though Silicon Valley is an obvious choice. Um, Berlin, what what does that have going for it in terms of uh, startups and ideas and, and its history involving technology? I think that Europe has also a lot of innovative technologies uh, to offer spread over the whole continent. And, and we as Cradle, our job is to cover the whole European area. Of course, since we're based in Berlin, so, so I think Berlin has been a good choice. It's central. There's a lot of startups here and, and, and even growing um, activities when it comes to deep tech. Originally, it, it used to be more, more focusing on, on internet companies, e-commerce. And, and what happened is that these people who, who are starting these companies, they actually made a lot of money. I mean, they, they've been quite successful. Instead of spending them, they decided to reinvest it basically into the ecosystem here. And, and that has been a very significant step to, to build up uh, Berlin as it is today. The creation of very innovative technologies are coming out of Berlin. And the city is really extremely international. Um, and, and, and that makes it just very easy to attract talent. And, and we feel that we came here at the right time. So we are growing with it. It sounds like an incredible vibe to be in Berlin. And I think I read somewhere that there's a new company that starts up every 20 minutes. So it's clearly uh, right. the place to be. Um, something that we've that we've come back to in this series and we've talked about is the, the image of Hyundai and how it's really changed over the last decade. I mean, obviously, Edwin, you travel a lot. So from a technology point of view, how are Hyundai seen now globally, do you think? Over the last years, uh, the... The image or the way Hyundai has presented themselves has, has changed a lot in terms of design, uh, in, in terms of technology. Uh, Hyundai has proven over the last years how seriously they are, they are trying to become a very innovative company. 
not only on the technology side, but also on creating new businesses, new areas they would like to be present in and try to stand out a little bit among other OEMs. So I think one example is our clear commitment when it comes to urban air mobility, which of course, as a car maker, makes totally sense to do because building vehicles, whether they fly or on the street, you need the manufacturing capabilities. Um, that has been quite, um, at least for my, for myself, this has been uh, yeah, a big uh, like wow effect and to see, okay, this company is really preparing for the future. But from my side, I, I, I also see Hyundai becoming very innovative and, and very eager to test new things and, and try out new things. Definitely, I think Hyundai today is totally different than it was five years ago. Right, even five years ago. And you're just talking about urban air mobility, which always makes a massive headline, I think. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it sounds very sexy. It sounds it sounds futuristic, even though we know it's not. And you're obviously working on that right now. And when I've talked about it with other guests on this podcast, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I can't really tell you anything at the moment. But what can you say about urban air technology in, in terms of not specific timing, but what are we going to see? What's it going to be used for? How are we going to be introduced to it? So it's not only creating this flying vehicle, but it's beyond that. It's also like creating the necessary infrastructure behind that. Because the last thing you want to do is when you yeah, create this technology to reduce basically to reduce traffic, but then cause more traffic because you, you need the people to get to these city airports, uh, then, then you're going the, the wrong direction. So that's definitely something which Urban Air Mobility Division of Hyundai is, is very aggressive on, on, on making sure that the right partnerships are in, in, in place, uh, the right technology and, and, and also the right yeah, logistics behind that will be um, starting along with the deployment. And, and here we, we are developing what we call purpose-built vehicles, ultimately autonomous vehicles who are synchronized um, with the infrastructure to allow efficient and fluent transportation towards these airports and then transition the, the passengers, the goods to the flying vehicles. I can't believe how many balls you're juggling in the mm -hmm. air at the moment at Cradle. It's, <laughs> it's absolutely fascinating. Can we talk a little bit about mm -hmm. robotics? Because it's another area of technology that I think has come on so much in the last 10 years. I mean, I used to present a gadget show um, 10 years ago and I would be doing a job with Asimo and the mm -hmm. problem or the amazing thing would be that he could walk up a stair, you know, and that was that was incredible at that time. And now you have them in every ho hotel in Japan welcoming right. you into the into the lift or, you know, whatever. Is it a case now that... that that robots specifically are now always pretty much integrated with AI and how much is robotics involved in, in buying a car, for example? When you build a car in the manufacturing line, you, you already have robotics. Uh, and, and maybe even before that, because you mentioned AI, AI is going to be used more and more also to design the car from the beginning. The strengths of AI is especially to, to take over repetitive tasks. Creating designs is, is extremely repetitive in some senses because you just change something, a small change, and then everything needs to be done again. And, and using AI, you can, yeah, you can and make it much faster and more efficient. And then when we talk about the manufacturing and, and specifically about robotics, robotics is going to play an extreme big role in the future when it comes to manufacturing. Definitely when we talk about robotics services in, 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 in space of, of logistic deliveries, creating robots, vehicles to, to do these tasks as well, uh, whether it's to deliver a pizza or maybe in the future to help post delivery services to carry heavy load from their car to the house or even up the stairs. That's definitely also going to be an area where robotics will take over more and more tasks. I, I, I think we don't even know yet how much we will use robotics in the future. And I believe there will be a lot uh, also at the household space. And I think what Hyundai is, is doing right now is to aggressively enter this space. So for instance, we invested in one of the leading robot companies, Boston Dynamics, recently. And, and that all shows our commitment to explore the, the potential of robotics. 
so a few personal bits from the past then, Edwin. What was your favourite car when you were growing up? Or did you well, not have um, a favourite car? Maybe you just had a favourite piece of technology. Yeah. So I, I was, of course, uh, very impressed with my younger brother. We were looking at night, watching Knight Rider. Yeah, I feel like it was every day. And that that, that has always been impressive um, and, and funny in a sense. Kit. Kit, right. And and, and, it, and it's funny because if you look at what Kit was at that time, we're not that far away from it, in fact. I mean, we have cars who are able to drive by themselves. We have cars who yeah have some ability to think uh, and, and talk. Um, I mean, the, the right combination of, of, of giving the car more intelligence and autonomy, probably not yet. But in general, um, th- that has in somehow even even later been, been some kind of inspiration to, to look at, hey, are, are we there yet? Do we, do we have kit already or not? Yeah, and, and maybe you see it's not about the car, but it's really the technology behind that and, and the use cases which it allowed. Other than that, um, yeah, I, I always think back on, on one of the James Bond cars with the amphibian car, the Lotus, mm-hmm. which is a car um, jumping into the sea uh, at the end. I had that as a toy, one of my first yeah, interactions when it comes to cars as an object. That's really fascinating. I, <laughs> I drove an um, amphibious <laughs> car in... Um... Switzerland and driving from the land into the sea and then being able to move on the sea was just extraordinary it felt like a bit of a bond moment for me but it it was a bit clunky but wow. I got the sense of it you know and it was uh, it was it was really fascinating really interesting did you also get out of the sea <laughs> I think I might have got a bit wet when I got out, actually. It was, a, it was a prototype. You know how these things go. There's always a few issues, right? But we were filming. so. Um, but yeah, isn't it incredible what influences you as a child? And you picking Kit from Knight Rider is so perfect. You know, for what you're doing now for your career, that you're creating Kit, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so when I was in US, I often visited CES and Kit was always at least at one of the booths. Of course, it was a copy of Kit. Then now it's, it's somehow part of my daily job. And what, and did you dream of, you know, flying cars or flying vehicles? Where, did you draw them growing up? Was, was it all ticking away in your brain? I, I always wanted to become a pilot because my dad was a pilot. So I, I was always been fascinated with air. So flying cars, yes, definitely. Uh, and and I'm, I'm I'm also quite proud to be somehow part of in a company developing that. And that, that I think takes us quite nicely onto smart cities and where mm-hmm. they're going and how how they are going to be and how they will affect our lives with with everything that you've just said really. So how transport is connecting with other areas of life for us. Absolutely. So so smart cities at the end is probably the the driver of everything what we're doing. Smart city is, is, what does it mean? It's, it's basically creating an environment uh, where people are safe, healthy, where everything should be easy to get access to. That, that, that's really the, the goal with what we want to achieve. And, and the way we do that is to contribute with, with new technologies, which step by step helps that. As a, as a car maker, of course, we can do a lot in the mobility space, uh, eventually also in the energy space. But it's also very interesting to see other areas uh, which contributes to become a, a smart city. And, and what we are planning to do as, as Cradle uh, is also to go and, and visit cities who, who we think are, are, are taking that extremely seriously, specifically talking about Scandinavian cities. The, the mindset over there is really to very focused on quality of life. So what we are planning is to prepare some kind of exploration trip to some of these cities, see what's going on there and try to translate that into what we could do. I fully believe that um, we, we will be able to create this kind of environment uh, where everyone is taking care of, of everything. And, and, and again, it brings me to, to, to the quality of life, how we can improve that through, through technologies. And when you talk about these Scandinavian cities, can you give us any examples of what they're doing that perhaps we aren't doing where we live that work so well? There's, there's quite some activities there that we, we are interested in. Yeah, logistics and mobility services. Also, just because they have different kind of yeah, infrastructure which, uh, which allows that. For instance, 
how can you use um, waterways more efficiently and combine that uh, with with the existing uh, mobility infrastructure? So things like that is, is very interesting to, to look at. Um, yeah, see what are the challenges uh, there, what are the opportunities, uh, what kind of new services could be created uh, with that. Uh, other other areas is, is, of course, in the energy space um, or, or specifically also health. Um, so a lot about um, building the right infrastructure of sensor technologies uh, and making yeah, meaningful uh, use cases or services uh, out of that. Um, What's also imp interesting to see is what Paris is doing, what they call uh, the 15-minute Paris, is to create an infrastructure so that you are able to do, yeah, to do whatever you want to do within 15 minutes of your home, meaning being able to do shopping, be, get, getting to work, uh, doing sports, uh, doing um, trips in the park. Uh, and with that, the, the benefit is that you, you will reduce the traffic uh, because you don't need to go from one end of the city to the other one because you have any, everything uh, around you. Home uh, environment, which gives you everything you need. It's such a wide picture, a broad base that you work across, it seems, having spoken to you. Really interesting to talk to you. Thank you very much. We always ask this question at the end of the podcast. It's called, Are We There Yet?, I'll get your take on it. Are we there yet? We're not there yet. Um, traffic needs to be improved, health, safety. There is a lot still to do, uh, but I feel like uh, we, are, we are getting there. And the way we do that is to contribute with new technologies, uh, new services, and a very clear willingness to get there. Edwin Erickson, it's been a joy talking to you. Thank you so much for your time to tell us about Cradle and all the innovation that's happening at Hyundai. Uh, have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much as well. If you're excited about these innovations and the projects Hyundai are leading, you can find out more at Hyundai.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the Are We There Yet podcast from your usual podcast provider. It means, of course, that you'll never miss an episode. Thank you so much for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>